Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, my name is Nabil Safdar. I'm the president of Imana. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to our series uh, where we try to present a reliable source of information to you about COVID-19 and coronavirus. Um, for the last 10 days or so, Imana volunteers, staff, and leadership have been working around the clock to monitor the rapidly changing situation related to COVID-19. And we've been calling for measures like aggressive social distancing to slow its spread. Our priority is your health and safety and the health and safety of the community at large. So we've been working hard to gather resources uh, for you all and to be a trusted source of information. Um, we realize at this point that everybody's at a different stage. There are some folks who understand this um, uh, from their training, from their life experience, from their backgrounds, without much explanation. And there are gonna be some of us um, within the audience and in our families and communities in general that uh, this is very scary for and uh, who really need to be reminded over and over again about some of the basics. We hope that tonight uh, you'll be able to get some of those basics in a way um, that addresses all of those different audiences, regardless of whether you're still confused about coronavirus and COVID-19, or whether you're really looking for some expertise and some advanced knowledge in that area. Before we get started, I wanna call your attention to what you'll see with the screen that I'm sharing. This is the imana.org website. And uh, what you'll notice is the general website is here at amana.org. If you click on the COVID-19 um, uh, link at the top, it'll take you to a number of resources, which we hope are going to be incredibly helpful for you. I know I found that very helpful personally. Um, as you try to navigate the onslaught of information related to coronavirus and COVID-19. So you'll see here some quick tips and updates as this web page is constantly being updated uh, on a daily basis. There are a number of resources from the CDC, the WHO, and other trusted sources of information. And then depending on what type of information you may be looking for, you'll have links to those trusted sources, links to the webinars and podcasts, several of which Dr. Syed, who we have with us today, has done spiritual advice, uh, advice and resources to preserve our mental health and information for communities. Um, one of the things that Imana is most proud of is being able to have been one of the lead organizations in this joint st statement from the National Muslim Task Force on COVID-19, uh, which really encouraged at a very early stage uh, before a lot of other organizations and entities were able to do so. Um, aggressive social distancing in our houses of worship, in our masajid, in our mosques. So please take a look at that. That's something that we're really excited and proud of. Um, in a moment, I'm gonna hand over screen control to Dr. Syed, but before I do that, let me tell uh, you a little bit about Dr. Syed and her background. Dr. Syed, is, uh, has been a member of Imana and has been an active volunteer uh, with the Islamic Medical Association of North America for years. She's based in New York and is a board certified infectious disease specialist uh, and on, is on with an antimicrobial stewardship committee position as well as an infection prevention committee uh, and she's well published in pneumonia related research. Um, she has been selected um, by the Infectious Disease Society of America to serve on the Inclusion, Diversity, Access, and Equity Task Force. And she's uh, established and leads the COVID-19 task forces in several Long Island area hospitals, very close to the epicenter of the outbreak and the spread of disease in New York and, New York and the surrounding areas. She's been a featured expert on several media outlets on infectious disease. Uh, her work has been covered and featured in media outlets such as the BBC, CBS, Fox 5, News 12, uh, Newsday, Syosset Advance, and others. Um, her humanitarian work, uh, when she's not busy clinically in her place of work, has spanned refugee resettlement, 
uh, to annual school supply and holiday toy drives to serving at soup kitchens. Dr. Syed has volunteered with UNICEF for children's rights and the UNGA to promote mobile health countries. In her spare time, uh, she's also really passionate about education and is the founder of uh, a nonprofit called Align Us, which provides mentorship and career development for high school students. She serves on several education related um, committees and she's co-founded the Eid Holiday Coalition Long, of Long Island and founded the National Eid Coalition, uh, uh, helping over two dozen school districts um, establish holidays during Eid. It's really my pleasure to uh, welcome uh, and recognize Dr. Syed's um, commitment and her leadership. Uh, Dr. Syed, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, we're going to go ahead and transfer screen uh, sharing from me to you. Thank you so much for that warm welcome. Really appreciate it. And it's my honor to be back here um, and share some updates with everybody and hopefully answer some questions that people have uh, being on the front lines, as you mentioned. Okay, very good much as I mentioned uh, for having me back, um, you know, being uh, in an evolving pandemic, um, as you're all aware, we're living through this, um, the days just sort of blend together. And, um, you know, every single day is the equivalent of a week, a week is the equivalent of a month. And things are so rapidly evolving. Uh, information, as you mentioned, is, you know, coming out just left and right. And there's so much to really um, keep up with. And it's, you know, really this sensory overload um, for a lot of the general public and for people in the healthcare industry for healthcare professionals to really try to keep up with everything that's coming and um, uh, frustrating at the same time as things keep changing. And that's really due to the fact that we are in the evolution of a pandemic of a novel virus, which we are still learning quite a bit about. Um, so, you know, a lot has um, changed since we last spoke. I was able to give a, uh, a webinar uh, with Imana recently talking about just the basics and the background of coronavirus, um, going over some details um, that it's a respiratory, you know, virus that is uh, pretty prevalent um, seasonally, um, except this this novel virus that we're dealing with is a new strain of that virus, and because no one essentially has been exposed to it before, um, we are seeing uh, you know a variation um, in symptoms and variation of presentation. Um, and I can tell you firsthand, being in New York, um, I have seen you know I've been following this since December uh, from Wuhan, and I can tell you that the presentations in the U.S. have been um, quite different um, from what you know we've been following um, uh, globally. And um, it's really interesting to see because you do have a really wide spectrum. You do have the clinical, you know, the classic presentations of fever, um, cough, and you know, shortness of breath. But you have, we have been seeing a lot of atypical presentations. Uh, patients coming in with, you know, very mild, vague symptoms of headaches, um, dizziness, lightheadedness. Many, many patients coming in with syncope that, incidentally, were found to have have, you know, ground glass infiltrates on imaging, a little bit hypoxic upon arrival, you know, leading to the diagnosis. I've had patients that have had GI symptoms. Um, you know, now we're seeing very, very prevalent GI symptoms along with um, COVID-19, but initially um, had many patients that came in with unrelated, you know, uh, diverticulitis, you know, things that we were not suspecting COVID in at all. And with imaging of the abdomen, we were finding these, uh, the, the basis of the lungs that can be seen on the CAT scan would then show us the classic presentation of the ground glass infiltrate. So, you know, because of the uh, the amount, the extent of community spread that we have at this point, um, we are seeing all the variations and symptoms, all uh, the spectrum of illness that people have from uh, completely asymptomatic to, you know, the very severe um, hypoxic, you know, respiratory distress, you know, needing hospitalization, um, mechanical ventilation, you know, ICU care. So really is a very wide spectrum. Um, I'm seeing a lot of cases of, you know, patients who don't really have underlying medical conditions that are also being affected uh, very, very um, seriously with this requiring hospitalization, even requiring ICU care. So it's been really um, interesting. It's been really challenging. Um, as you've heard in the media, um, you know, there is quite a bit of strain on the healthcare system, especially in New York. I'm seeing it firsthand, um, you know, with the most number of cases that we have, we really are seeing that strain, um, you know, have been for a couple of weeks, and we actually are anticipating our peak in about a week or so. And then, you know, um, the strain is going to be uh, present still going forward. But really, what we're relying on is, you know, for the community um, to continue to do what they've been doing with the mitigation practices to help us through this time. So I just want to give you a little bit of updates on what's happening globally. 
So if we look at the world right now, um, we have over 932,605 total confirmed cases worldwide, out of which we have roughly about 46,000 um, deaths, and then we have 193,000, over 193,000 cases um, that have recovered from it. So, you know, we're still seeing that majority of people are having mild illness or even hospitalization, but then are recovering from this. Um, but what's interesting to look at is the number, the number of more, the amount of mortality that we have from this disease. Again, you know, really significant numbers. And even within the U.S., you know, we are seeing these numbers rising on a daily basis. And, you know, this is just something unusual for us. We have a lot of other conditions that have significant morbidity and mortality. But obviously, with a novel virus and a pandemic of this sort, you know, we are not used to seeing this kind of effect at, you know, such a large scale in such a short amount of time. Um, if we look globally, you can see that the U.S. has already, you know, surpassed, you know, numbers uh, globally. We, you know, we had beat China a while ago already, um, and now we're up to 213 cases um, nationally. Um, following us is Italy and Spain, and then you can see the numbers going down China, and followed by that we have Germany, France, uh, Iran, and the U.K., um, and if you look at the number of deaths, you can see that, you know, Italy is still on top there with the most um, number of mortalities and their healthcare system, as you've been seeing in the news and following closely, is, you know, facing significant strain and they're just overwhelmed. Um, the entire country is really dealing with the consequences of this. And, you know, we have been following them very, very closely because, as you know, we were pretty much set up. New York was set up to be on the same trajectory as Italy, which is why. We were very aggressive in um, putting in place our, you know, uh, social distancing and mitigation practices um, for about two weeks now, um, essentially, you know, anticipating uh, what's coming ahead. Um, you know, at, at this point, it's hard for us to tell how effective um, this is being. Uh, I know and we know that it's definitely helping. It's just that we will not be able to prove the extent of that till we're out of sort of our peak Till we plateau out a little bit and then we can see what's happening because, you know, in the essence, we're still behind. You know, we are still, our numbers now are reflecting the hospitalizations that we have now are reflective of the people that were exposed um, and infected roughly about two weeks ago. So, you know, we have to sort of wait and see, you know, what the numbers show us, but we know that this is the right approach and this is the only thing that's going to help us. And as a nation, this is really where the focus needs to be on now because we know that um, if you look at New York as an example for the rest of the country, we can see, we know that we're the epicenter and we know that we have the most number of hospitalizations, the most number of cases, and uh, the most number of mortality um, in the nation. And again, you have to keep in mind that this is still an underrepresentation because as you're aware, the testing that was rolled out, you know, we were very much limited with our testing from the beginning. There were some restrictions with that. There were some issues with our test kits. There were some issues with the assays. Um, there was limitations in that, and that set us back a few weeks as well. Um, there was, there are still limitations with the turnaround time on a lot of these tests, and there's been a lot of advances that are being done um, on a daily basis to help with this. But overall, as a nation, we are still very far behind other nations that, uh, such as you know South Korea, that you look at that have really done a, a tremendous job in you know really focusing on testing. Uh, maximum number of people as possible and to really work on identifying the people that are affected, contact tracing for those people, and then really isolating um, and putting into, uh, into measures of um, isolation and quarantining those people to prevent further spread. Again, just a summary again of the number of cases worldwide, the number of deaths and the number that have recovered. And if you look at uh, the number of active cases that we have, we have over 691,000 infected patients. About 656 of them are in mild condition and about 35,000 of them are in serious um, or critical condition. Um, and the closed cases on the right, you'll look at, you have about 240,000 cases which had an outcome. Approximately 81% of those had recovered and have been discharged and about 19% of those have had mortality. Now, again, those numbers seem, you know, uh, more or less, you know, we have a more of a positive outcome, which is, you know, good thing to look at. But when you look at 
um, numbers on a whole scale globally and nationally, these are still significant mortalities that we are not used to seeing, um, especially with a respiratory illness. And the reason why it is so challenging to really have any, um, um, any aims or attempts of containment of this virus is because we have such a wide spectrum of illness, because there is so much asymptomatic transmission um, and viral shedding and you know, transmission even while people have mild symptoms or no symptoms, it becomes virtually impossible to really contain it. And that's why you know, the mitigation practices that we have now are really what's needed to um, you know, keep things under control as best as possible going forward. And you can see these curves here, the linear curves, which is showing uh, really sharp you know, um, inclines in these. Looking at the United States, um, you know, we can see this was very different. Um, you know, I've done lots of talks um, on COVID and uh, within every week, there is so much change on this map. Um, about a month ago, there was barely anything. Um, and now you can see the entire United States is essentially affected by this. Um, and you can see where our epicenters are and where our, our hot zones are. And, you know, we started off with New York, but you can see very clearly the areas that are in these dark red colors are the really the ones that are of concern. So you can see New York is obviously there. We have Massachusetts, we have um, Florida, you can see Illinois, Michigan, California, you know, and you can see where the next areas of concerns are as well. So, you know, the rest of the country should really look at New York um, and should have been already looking at New York as a warning sign um, and start preparing uh, so that we are really uh, as best equipped for what's coming as possible. Because as I mentioned before, being in New York, we really have a significant strain on the healthcare system. And um, it's not just a strain on the system and the healthcare workers, but uh, the amount of illness, uh, the amount of critical um, illness in these patients and uh, the acuity of these patients and even the more mortality that I'm seeing is very, very intense. And, you know, as you know, this is a novel virus and there's really no FDA approved treatment for this virus. So we really have nothing except supportive measures. So the only thing that we can do to beat this virus is to prevent spread. And that's really what the focus has to be on. If you look state by state, this just breaks it down in the different states and the amount of um, disease burden that you have in different states. Again, we are anticipating again that this is still an underrepresentation of the numbers um, uh, of actual cases because you know the more testing that we have, the more representation we have of the actual affected cases. So you can see the numbers are climbing. Um, in Florida, you have over 6,000 cases already. Um, Illinois has close to 6,000 cases. Massachusetts has over 6,000. Uh, Michigan has over 7,000 cases. New Jersey has over 18,000. New York, you can see the number there, 74,000. Um, and, uh, you know, Pennsylvania is going up to nearly 5,000. Numbers climbing. Again, Washington is close to 5,000 as well. So if we look at, uh, this is just looking at New York out of our 45,000 cases reported. Um, you can see that total number of hospitalizations is roughly about um, close to 10,000 and the deaths as of um, this evening has been about 13,074. Again, we have many, many patients that are in the hospital that are critically ill right now. And as I mentioned that these patients, um, you know, a lot of them have been in the hospital for about two weeks and um, we're really still dealing with the first um, batch of uh, um people that have been affected by this. And as I mentioned before, that we are reaching, we are anticipating that our peak is going to be in about a week. Um, and so these are just going to continue to rise. If you look at the cases that have been reported in New York, just looking at the number of hospitalizations, uh, the number of deaths that have been happening, um, they broke it down a little bit by the boroughs. Um, looking at the rates by age. So it was really interesting. Uh, MMWR had put out a report about a week ago, uh, uh, about two weeks ago, that showed that the majority of cases um, of hospitalization, actually the, the biggest chunk of uh, patient population was actually ages um, uh, between um, 18 to um, 44. Um, and that was early on. And then after that, now we've seen it um, change a little bit, you know, and that's important to note that in a pandemic that's evolving, we are going to see variations all the time based on our mitigation practices. Also, we might see changes. Um, and these numbers are going to continue to change because we are essentially able to control the narrative and that's what we need to do right now we need to continue to shelter in place to have better outcome on these results but um, as I mentioned before I have seen many many um, young people admitted to the hospital because this virus is affecting it's not discriminating against anybody it's affecting all ages and people are sick enough where they're requiring hospitalization or even requiring that visit to the emergency room because their symptoms are that severe um, and they are having that much shortness of breath that it's requiring that ER visit 
Um, this is just looking at some of the cases in the past month, and you can see here the number of cases continues to rise. And then again, looking at hospitalizations um, within the ICUs and um, patients with underlying, you know, you know medical conditions or not. Um, obviously, you know the early predictive um, uh, values that we have and what we've been following globally about patients with underlying medical conditions being affected more, patients um, who are elderly being affected more. We know that as the age goes um, above, you know, 60, 70, and 80, we have higher um, chances of hospitalization, higher incidence of ICU care, um, needing ventilators, and and a more poor outcome and increasing mortality. So we are seeing those trends here as well. But at the same time, because of the volume, because of the number of people that are being affected, as I mentioned before, just in New York alone, if you look at the volume of people being affected, it's still a significant number of people that normally would not be uh, presenting to the hospital that would not be hospitalized. So, you know, so those numbers um, are what's causing, you know, these, this sort of, sort of spiraling uh, scenario. And that's what we have to sort of control. And that's what the rest of the nation really needs to look at is how to continue to mitigate um, so that we can have, you know, the best possible outcome given the scenario that we're in, um, given that, you know, we have no treatment modality for this uh, novel virus. And, um, you know, really what we have to do is stop it in its track and try to prevent it um, from further spread. So um, just things that I want to keep uh, reiterating that I've been saying, you've heard me say this whole time, is mitigation practices, social distancing, and sheltering in place. This is really what we've been doing in New York. Um, and honestly, um, this is what the entire nation needs to continue to do. I know we are doing it in many states as we are seeing more and more um, cases being reported uh, throughout the US. And um, it is a little bit of an inconvenience for the general population. It is an effect on the economy and there's so many variables. Um, essentially we went from living normal lives to just you know, hitting the brakes and um, everything just coming to a halt. But um, in the end, you know, this is gonna be the only thing that's gonna save lives. And so this quote I thought was very um, uh, important right now and just so poignant. And uh, this was from the president of the Republic of Ghana who said, we know how to bring the economy back to life what we do not know is how to bring people back to life. We will therefore protect the people's lives and then their livelihoods. And I think that just sums it up um, so beautifully right now that the focus has to be on just mitigation and preventing further spread of this illness and um, essentially acting at this point uh, like as if some everybody is has in fact been exposed to this. And the more that we can distance ourselves and prevent um, interaction than, you know, outside of our households, then that is another step of preventing this virus from spreading. Thank you. Dr. Sayed, thank you so much. Um, we have a number of questions, um, which uh, I'm really looking forward to posing uh, to you so that you can help us make sense of the situation that we're um, facing right now. Um, one thing that I think is on a lot of people's minds, and, and I've sensed that this is on uh, people's minds, regardless of whether they are healthcare workers, physicians, nurses, other frontline staff, um, or whether they're just family members, community members, and that is about PPE uh, or personal protective mm -hmm. equipment, gloves, masks, and you can imagine. Uh, I've seen, um, you know, I work with multiple healthcare systems myself, and even the recommendations between the different healthcare systems and the various agencies that uh, we seek guidance from have evolved over time uh, with regards to their advice about whether folks should be wearing surgical masks or N95s, uh, be gloved or ungloved when just hand sanitizer is enough. And uh, it's, it's been very confusing for a lot of people. Um, how can you help us make sense of it? And keeping in mind that for some people, They've never heard what an, of what an N95 is and may not understand um, the difference between a surgical mask and an N95. How can you help us make a little bit more sense right. of that? So um, I understand um, the confusion and I appreciate the confusion and I think we all share the same sentiment. Um, it's been a frustrating um, for everybody, people in the healthcare um, you know, industry, uh, the general public, the information 
I mentioned is constantly evolving. It's hard to sort of keep up. The guidelines keep changing. You know, the CDC keeps changing its recommendations, and um, a lot of it is on the is based on the WHO as well. It's based on the fact that we are in a global pandemic. There's so much. Uh, so, uh, so many countries that are being affected. There's so much of the world's population that is being affected. And it's, you know, a lot of the, uh, the guidance that's coming out is changing based on, you know, um, need and supply and demand and based on what we know um, at this point, at this time and place. So, you know, there, there's different ways of um, answering these questions based on if it's focused for the general public who are not in healthcare versus people in healthcare. Um, so coronavirus is a respiratory virus, um, you know, uh, that has been around for a long time. And in essence, normally, you know, the way these viruses and what we know, the, the way that the virus is transmitted is by respiratory droplets. So, you know, when somebody is caught coughing or sneezing, you know, these droplets get expelled. And then, you know, if you're in close contact to that person and these infectious droplets can then go into any of your mucous membranes, meaning it can go into your eyes, your nose, your mouth, or land on any, uh, you know, your hands that can become infected. And then you touch these surfaces, you know, your mouth or anything like that, um, you can then contract the virus. And so that's why the notion behind it is that, you know, um, the droplet and the contact precautions because of, you know, having this mask on to, uh, to prevent, um, you know, these infectious droplets, um, you know, from uh, coming uh, into, you know, you coming into contact with them. Um, as far as, you know, the N95 mask and the surgical mask, you know, um, there is, you're absolutely right, there's so much discordance between between health systems, outside of health systems, between different agencies, everybody's sort of doing different things all the time. And that's because there is, you know, as I mentioned before, it's still a novel virus. There's a lot that we're learning about it. The general guidance from the CDC has been that, um, you know, for normal patients who are not undergoing high risk aerosolizing procedures that a surgical mask and a gown and an eye shield, you know, so it's a modified contact and droplet sort of scenario where you have to have protective eyewear because again, as I mentioned, these infectious droplets can go into your eyes and then you could become infected. Um, that along with the gown and gloves, you know, all of these precautions um, are what's recommended. You know, the N95 mask is recommended by the CDC for patients that um, are undergoing high risk procedures with can which can then aerosolize these infectious particles. So um, any aggressive suctioning, any, you know, intubations, anything where these particles have um, a chance to aerosolize and put that person who is in close proximity to them at risk, you know, for those uh, patients, those scenarios, it is recommended to have N95 masks. Again, an N95 mask is not something that the general public um, has even, you know, ever encountered, as you, men as you mentioned before. These are very specific masks that healthcare workers have been trained to use. Essentially, you know, it's not one size fits all. There are different sizes for these masks. People have had formal um, fit testing for these because they're individualized to your faces. So the whole purpose of it is for it to have a proper seal so that there's no um, air coming in. Um, and for that reason, it's not really recommended for the general public to wear an N95 mask because first of all, it could be the wrong mask. Second of all, there's a whole um, system and an art to it as far as you know um, having proper training for it. Um, that's why these these masks, when, uh, when you look back, you know, there was all this notion and all this um, uh, information coming out and people sort of went around buying all these N95 masks um, in the community and hospitals, you know, healthcare workers were really then um, shortened of PPE, um, the people that are on the front lines that really needed these. Um, so for the general public, you know, the recommendation has always been that a mask was recommended for anybody who was potentially sick. So early on when people were in the very early stages, many weeks ago when people were first starting to exhibit some symptoms, the mask was recommended for somebody who might have fevers or respiratory symptoms to contain their own droplets so that they're preventing spread. Now, if where we are right now, we have so much community transmission and we have so such a wide, such widespread illness. And um, as well, we have this big spectrum of illness where we have so much transmission from asymptomatic carriers or people who may be incubating. As you know, the incubation uh, can be one day and up to about 14 days with an average being about five days before people develop symptoms. So you might be you know, interacting with somebody who was fine one day and then the next day they start having fevers and cough and and, you know, uh, shortness of breath. And so, you know, uh, because there's so much 
much of that community spread. Now, you know, you sort of have to, um, you know, anticipate that somebody that you are coming in close proximity proximity with who you know may not be in your household again at this point we're assuming that most people are restricted to their own households right now and everybody's generally healthy but if you are saying going to the grocery store or you know coming into contact with somebody you know we always recommend that six feet of distance for that reason but if you do have some closer contact you know the mask if somebody else is masking themselves if they are in fact incubating, um, if they're wearing that mask, then that's protective for you as well, because then it's lowering the amount of transmission that could be happening from them as they're, you know, developing a, sort of on the verge of developing symptoms and still actively shedding the virus. So it is very confusing. There's a lot of discordance between healthcare systems it, within the nation globally, you know, and a lot of it um, and a lot of the frustrations is coming from the lack of PPE. And, you know, had there been a different scenario um, and and there should have been a different scenario where we were a little bit more prepared and had the resources that all the people on the front line really need. Um, ideally, it's always better to be more cautious and have the most, you know, preparation and be, um, you know, overly protective and overly cautious than not. Um, however, we're in a situation, especially in New York, where we have extremely limited resources, um, where we're having to reuse a lot of our PPE and resort to alternate measures, which we would have never dreamt about um, in, in a million years. And um, it's a really unfortunate situation. And recently I read an article that a lot of our, um, even N95 masks were, you know, uh, several weeks ago, right before, you know, we hit, you know, our, our surge, um, several weeks ago, they were all, you know, sold um, to, uh, outside of the US. Um, and they're globally, there were a lot of um, uh, people that purchased these masks. So, you know, so we, have a lot to learn from this experience and we need to make sure that this sort of thing never ever happens again. But, you know, really um, there needs to be a huge, you know, we've had lots of community members that have been fundraising to really um, get some of this PPE, but, you know, the government is working on, you know, getting more PPE to healthcare workers. I, I can't tell you that it, it's not happening fast enough, even though everybody's working fast in a pandemic, things move so, so quickly. And as I mentioned before, we have so many people that are being affected that things need to be even faster than they are right now. Thank you. Um, you know, uh, um, another source of um, confusion for folks, and again, mostly for people in the community, but uh, extends to people who are working in healthcare as well, is the um, heterogeneous types of tests that are available, when to get tests, and when to not get testing. So uh, we know now that there's a lot of asymptomatic, um, you know, there may be a lot of asymptomatic people, people who don't have symptoms at all, who may be carriers of the virus, who could be shedding virus. There are people who may come into contact with people who've been uh, COVID-19 positive, um, but who feel okay themselves. And then there are people who are getting sick. Uh, in these situations, when should someone stay home, not do anything? When should someone call their doctor or provider when should someone go to the emergency room? And then once they do, what explains the difference between the fact that some um, it, it places they can get a test result within a few hours and other places it may be a few days? So um, yeah, that's a great question. And ideally, uh, what should be happening? Uh, you know, so there's two different answers to this: what should be happening and what is in fact happening. So what should be happening is what I mentioned before, where we have you know exuberant amount of tests available where everybody's getting tested and we identify people right away from asymptomatic to very symptomatic and we make sure that we do the contact tracing and we isolate appropriately and we control it. What's actually happening is again, because we are limited um, in our testing ability still, um, we are limited in our resources, you know, even to the fact where we have limited swabs, you know. Um, so first it was an issue with the actual testing kit, then it was an issue with reagents and assays, and now it's, you know, a shortage of swabs. So there's limitations in every aspect. And that's why the guidance changes so quickly. Um, and initially, if you recall the recommendations from the CDC, a lot of people who we were suspecting early on did not even meet the criteria because very early on it was just about well, have you had travel or not um, even though you know we know now that there's so much community spread so you know those recommendations keep changing very very rapidly again based on the evolution of you know the pandemic um, so we have to work with what we have best so you know right now um, if you have a scenario what they're recommending if you have no symptoms they're not testing people that are asymptomatic just based on the fact that there's not enough testing not enough capacity to even do that um, but if people have had contact with somebody who's been tested positive COVID, the recommendation is that person should really 
treat themselves as if they are, you know, incubating, you know, there is a chance that they could develop symptoms. You know, again, it depends on how much contact have they had? Have they been in close proximity? Have they been in contact with them where they're, you know, um, sharing items, you know, touching the same surfaces? Are they, you know, less than six feet away from them? Have they had prolonged amount of contact or not? There's a lot of different variables, but the safest thing to do is to really isolate yourself for two weeks to see if you develop any symptoms after coming into contact with that person. As I mentioned before, five days is the average incubation, uh, but it can happen in less time for some people and longer time for other people. But the safest thing to do is to assume that, okay, if you had contact with them, there is a chance that, you know, you could be incubating right now. And so take precautions, you know, even within your household, if you can try to keep distance away from certain, you know, people, especially if you have elderly immunocompromised people in your household as much as you can um, just to watch yourself so that we can again this is a way that we can you know stop um, the spread of the virus as much as we can again in a household it's very difficult and not everybody's able to do this but you know people that are symptomatic I always recommend if they can be in a separate room with a separate bathroom as best as possible um, that's really the way to do it um, if they're having symptoms um, now moving on to somebody that has symptoms you know so for the most part people who have symptoms are getting tested um, just so that you know you know if you're positive and then you know specifically you know what you need to do and contact trace the people that you've been in contact with in the past you know two weeks who to see if they have developed symptoms or they will develop symptoms so that they can pretty much uh, behave the same way try to isolate themselves try to watch for symptoms and then get tested if you have symptoms um, along the course of illness like i mentioned before most people are having recovery and are doing fine um, what i have noticed is that there's definitely a bimodal distribution you know the first week people initially people are not feeling well and then they sort of get over the hump and then the second week we have a lot of people coming back with significant you know symptoms and respiratory symptoms so the thing uh, that we tell most people is that you know if you're feeling fine with just some fevers or achiness and otherwise doing okay is to just continue um, watching yourself at home you know very closely make sure that you know you're staying hydrated and eating you know most people don't have an appetite um, but as long as you're feeling relatively fine otherwise that it's fine to just stick it out at home because as I mentioned before most people will have that recovery and will do just fine um, everybody who's mildly symptomatic uh, coming to the ER is just again the strain on the healthcare system which right now is really um, burdened with the acutely ill patients that need hospitalization. So for, that's why we're trying to do testing outside of, uh, outside of the ERs to really take care of these people and direct them in the right way. The thing to look for, the symptom that should be sort of a warning sign is if you have a lot of shortness of breath with minimal activity, okay? So we usually say if you have dyspnea ex on exertion with um, minimal activity. So if you feel like you can't take a step or two without being winded, you can't catch your breath, all of a sudden your symptoms are you know changing drastically that's that's a signal to call the doctor or go to the ER. You know, in any point of your illness, if you're not feeling well, it's always advisable to speak to a healthcare professional. Um, this doesn't mean, you know, just because we're recommending that people stay home with mild illness doesn't mean that they should not be accessing um, the healthcare system via different methods. You know, there's a lot of telemedicine happening right now. A, a lot of physicians are available um, to answer calls by phone. So you should always seek medical care if you're not feeling well, if there's something alarming um, from your symptoms. And again, if you get to that spectrum of illness where you're really short of breath and not feeling well and you're having chest pain or any other symptoms then certainly you know ER visitation is appropriate and you know you need to be triaged appropriately based on your symptoms I think I answered all the parts <laughs> yes yes um, yeah thank you so much and um, you know so we've talked a little bit about um, prevention with PPE we've talked a little bit about testing symptoms and what someone should do um, you know, we're getting a lot of different sources of information about treatment. And I think it's confusing to a lot of people that I've talked to who, you know, we on one hand say there's no direct way for us to treat the virus that we know right now. And yet people are going to the hospital and we're seeing all kinds of uh, various reports about the use of antivirals or hydroxychloroquine. Um, there are trials uh, uh, and Nawer Hossein submitted this uh, comment and question uh, during the session, thank you for your, your comment about the use of plasmapheresis uh, for the treatment of severely ill patients uh, with some potentially promising results in some places. And, and so we're seeing a lot of a velocity of information about potential treatments um, besides just the supportive measures that we know um, will be necessary in the most severe cases. Um, are there any of these treatments that seem promising, are there any that have really been proven at this point? 
Um, and what can we expect in terms of treatments and in the future, hopefully, a vaccine? So that's a great question. And I think this is another um, point that is very frustrating and confusing for not just the general public, but for uh, people in healthcare as well. So as I mentioned before, there is still no FDA approved treatment for COVID-19. Um, there are a lot of different uh, medications out there, as you mentioned, that have FDA approval for alternate um, illnesses and diagnoses and that people are trying, but these are all anecdotal. Um, you know, we're following a lot of studies coming out globally. We have been from China. Um, we continue to do so from Italy, from France, from um, the whole world to see, you know, what's happening. But um, unfortunately, there, we still need a lot more data. Uh, you know, in medicine, um, everything has to be, it's evidence-based medicine that we practice. And we need to see, is, you know, the outcome really a good one or not? You know, so you need a sample size. You need people who, in a controlled environment, are getting a certain medication to prove, really, have they had um, positive outcome as a result of these medications. And you have to also remember that a lot of these medications can cause more harm as well. So, you know, we have to keep all these things in mind. The issue that's happening right now is because of the burden of illness and the severity of symptoms and um, you know how quickly people are decompensating, um, we're in this situation where as healthcare professionals, especially in infectious diseases and in medicine in general, we are very much used to um, having a cure. We are used to treating people. We are used to seeing people in the United States, especially um, get better, You know, be on the mend. And so people, it's natural to be grasping for straws. It's natural to want to give something, to do something in hopes of uh, obtaining a, you know, achieving a positive outcome. But as of now, there's still no FDA approved medication. There's a lot of clinical trials that are ongoing globally um, and nationally. So we have clinical trials going on for remdesivir, which is a nucleoside analog. Um, we've got clinical trials going on for interleukin-6 blockers, and those are really for the later stages to really block, you know, the cytokine storm um, that people are having. So there's different drugs that are, uh, you know, in these classes that are uh, being looked at. Hydroxychloroquine, which has been in mainstream media so much, along with Zithromax, which is a very common antibiotic, uh, again, in mainstream media so much lately, um, but really needs to be looked at very, very closely. Um, I mean, I think the first study that came out um, you know, of France was a very small study. It was only 20 patients. And I think, you know, too much, um, you know, too much uh, emphasis was focused on that one study when we all know from the medicine, the type of medicine that we practice that you really need more data. You need to show that there's good outcomes, you know, from these drugs um, without doing more harm. Again, there's, as I mentioned before, there's potential, you know, side effects from different medications. And also um, you have to remember there are people, as you're aware, there are people that are on these medications baseline for their other, um, you know, inflammatory conditions, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, things like that, and they can't access these medications um, because of this national shortage. Um, there's a lot of uh, antiretrovirals that are being used and that have been used globally. Again, more data needs to be gathered for these. Um, we have to prove that, you know, all, any of these medications um, are in fact effective. You know, it's just too early to tell right now. And the issue is that there's so much global impact that people um, want th uh, there to be, you know, a treatment for it. But unfortunately, there's really no magic bullet right now that is preventing or that is proving that there's um, cure at this point. The convalescent plasma that you mentioned before, um, that is something that was used previously. Um, that approach was used with uh, with the Spanish flu. And, um, you know, that seems promising right now. Um, we have seen it rolled out already in New York. Um, and we'll have to see. There's a, a little um, rate limiting step with that as far as getting widespread antibody testing. Again, we're limited with our testing uh, ability, but, you know, that is something that, you know, looks promising right now. We have to see, again, as we are using it more and we're collecting the data and, see, and we have to see how patients are actually responding to it. Uh, again, there's very strict criteria of how people meet criteria to be donors, who meets criteria to receive it, um, and we'll have to wait and see what the numbers show. Um, and then the fin finally, the vaccine development, you know, that's already underway. You must have heard most people have been following the news very closely. Things are moving much quicker than they ever have in the past. Um, but even with the pace at which things are moving, um, you know, vaccine development is the process. Again, we have to prove that what we are putting together, um, what we are potentially going to provide for the general public has to be safe. And we have to show that it has positive outcome. So that kind of scenario usually is about a minimum of a year to 18 months. Um, so that's really what we're looking at as, you know, uh, you know, that's going to be like a secondary prevention method, you know, for us right now, 
our our main focus really the only thing that we know that really kills this virus is hand washing um you know soap and water and you know alcohol based gels um keeping a distance of 6 feet you know preventing the virus from transmitting you know social distancing these are the things that we know um essentially work and that's what we have to keep doing Thank you. So we have questions that were submitted ahead of time. We have a question from uh, Dr. Muhammad in Australia who asks about how infectious we uh, think COVID-19 coronavirus rather is. Um, so, and he asks uh, in a way that talks about the r naught. So maybe you could tell us about the infectivity of the virus. And another specific question about we know that um, th this is uh, transmitted potentially through respiratory droplets, um, but what about other bodily fluids, stool, et cetera? Could those be infectious as well? Yeah, so those are great questions. So um, early on, actually, in China, the first, you know, um, as I mentioned, I've been following it since December. In January, there was a few case reports of GI symptoms in, in these patients that were having, um, you know, that were diagnosed with SARS-CoV-2, you know, COVID-19. <clears throat> and, um, you know, uh, initially there was a concern, could it be transmitted um, through, you know, contact with, you know, um, stool, you know, urine, things like that. But once they had done the testing on all these specimens, they did not find significant viral particles or that to be a significant mode of transmission. Um, so again, sticking again to what we know about the virus, again, it's respiratory um, and contact, you know, it can survive on surfaces. So that's why disinfecting surfaces um, is, you know, the most important thing to kill this virus, because we know what kinds of, you know, cleaners um, and soaps and things of that nature are adequate in uh, in killing the virus and disinfecting the surfaces. That's, that's what the practice is based on. As far as infectivity, so this virus, this is actually, I had shared this slide in one of my other presentations, um, it's quite contagious. Um, and that's the problem that we're facing with um, SARS-CoV-2. That's the name of the virus that causes the illness, COVID-19. So the thing that makes it so unique is how communicable it is um, and you know how many people it potentially can infect. Um, you know, it's a relative of SARS, as you're aware, which is why the name is similar. But the, the thing with SARS that was interesting is that people usually presented with symptoms, um, you know, rather quickly, once they presented with the respiratory symptoms, you knew that they had that illness, and therefore you could isolate them and contain it. Here we have an illness which you have a huge spectrum of symptoms from asymptomatic to mildly symptomatic, and that's where we get into the problem of preventing the spread, you know, so the r naught was, you know, mentioned, you know, many weeks ago as roughly between um, two to three, but about, you know, 2.2 to 2.4, uh, meaning for every person that has the virus, you know, whoever they come into contact with, they will, you know, infect um, a little bit over two people. So, you know, the more um, that this, you know, pandemic evolves, the more data that we get, the more numbers we have, the better idea we have of that, that number, you know, as I mentioned, the numbers in pandemics are constantly changing because we are in the middle of it. It's hard for us to give definitive um, data even on the case fatality rate that while you're in the middle of a pandemic. You have to wait for everything to be over to gather all the data, which is why testing is so important because you need to have that denominator. You need to know the total number of people affected so that you can have an accurate calculation of you know, what that ratio actually is. Thank you. And, and we have another question from our online audience. This is from Sayed Rahman. Um, and he asks, uh, what are some practical steps that staff, presumably in a healthcare setting, uh, but potentially in other workplace settings as well, um, you know, uh, workers in uh, crowded public places as well, um, what are some practical steps that staff can take to protect themselves from infection? At what points are they most susceptible to infection? And what, is, what are the best routes of protecting their families? So that's a great question. I think we've been sort of uh, focusing on this for a long time. And I think, you know, the answer is going to always be um, the same uh, important pearls, you know, hand washing for 20 seconds, at least, you know, you have to do the adequate hand washing, um, not touching your face. Again, things that we do very commonly. Um, and it's sort of like, uh, you know, an innate, like a reflex. We're used to touching our face all the time. We have to be cognizant of that and just, you know, avoid that and, and make an effort to consciously not do that. Um, and, you know, wiping down the surfaces, as I mentioned, you know, we know that the virus is killed, you know, with the cleaners, um, with soap. So we want to make 
sure that we keep doing that. So in a healthcare setting, you know, if you are in a hospital, you know, you have to, and even in the home environment, you know, these infectious particles can live on surfaces. So whether it's a doorknob, whether it's, you know, the refrigerator handle, you know, anything that's very commonly and frequently used, you should continue to disinfect those surfaces because that's how you, you're going to continue to transmit um, the virus. So for families, um, so, you know, speaking from a healthcare perspective, again, as I mentioned before, because we have so much community spread, you did mention something about uh, large crowds and everything like that. So at this point, you know, nationally, we need to be at a level where these large gatherings are not happening. As I mentioned before, there's so much community spread and you're not going to see the effects of that spread for several weeks, you know, but now these gatherings happening, people that you're around, you have to assume that majority of people have been exposed and are incubating. So, you know, that's going to continue to, you know, propagate this virus uh, and the transmission of this virus. So if you, again, are in a close gathering, a close scenario where you're less than six feet away from from somebody and they're not masked, you know, you should really assume that anybody you come into contact with could potentially be incubating the virus, which is why we're trying to do these shelter in places and people sort of um, stick within their households as much as possible. Um, for the healthcare worker, <clears throat> again, and even for the community member, if you have any concern that you might have been exposed to somebody, whether it be at work, um, you know, in the hospital, or any other work that you're doing that's essential that you might have had contact with. Um, somebody say you work, uh, you know, at a grocery store or anything like that, and you have concern that, you know, you might have been exposed and you want to protect your family at home. The best thing to do is obviously we always say, you know, hand washing, uh, hand hygiene and, and things like that. But, you know, anytime you're coming back into the home environment, we always recommend that, you know, you change your clothes and you shower and anything, any um, thing that's on you that potentially could have, you know, come into contact with infectious, you know, um, respiratory droplets, you know, that can live on surfaces for some time, you should put into a bag if you can't immediately get it into, you know, um, the washer. And then you should shower and, you know, essentially, you know, a, a decontamination, a decon um, should happen before you enter the house. And then if you're asymptomatic and you're feeling fine, continue to do the same thing. Frequent hand washing, frequently wiping down all the common areas in the household. If you're very high risk where you know somebody was tested positive and you are very close contact with them for an extended amount of time, you should take an even more precaution and try to isolate yourself into a separate um, area of the house as much as possible. Um, and, you know, even wear a mask for the, those couple of days that you might be incubating um, until, you know, you're complete, completely out of that window where you potentially could be infecting other people in the household. Great, thank you so much. We have one last question. We, actually, we have a, a lot of questions, but we only have time for one more question. I wish we had more. Um, uh, the question is really about, you have a, a unique experience because you are um, near the, you're at the epicenter in the United States of um, where we have the greatest number of infections. Um, and in particular, there's a lot of um, population density in some of these areas in New York uh, which certainly affects that. But across the country, um, the uh, regulations, laws, recommendations about sheltering in place, or in some cases about uh, potential penalties for going out um, for citizens of various jurisdictions really vary. Because of your what you've seen, what would you tell someone who is you know, there's not as much of a prevalence of infection in their particular location, or maybe their um, government leaders are not taking it quite as seriously as you may be in New York. What kind of advice do you have for all of us, especially considering that we have some major holidays coming up, Easter, uh, Ramadan, in the next few weeks? So yeah, that's a great, um, great question. And I think, um, you know, I hate to be an alarmist. Um, and for the most part, I've always tried to give um, information that was, uh, you know, uh, relevant and, uh, you know, to try to tell people to be cautious without causing alarm. And a little bit overwhelming for people and there's a lot of anxiety even in the general population um, but I think it's better to be cautious and it's better for people to sort of be um, aware of everything I think you know um, in general um, all of us you know I've been watching uh, obviously people in healthcare have been watching uh, closely what's happening but um, as a nation we generally have a tendency of feeling sort of invincible and you know a little bit of out of sight out of mind and you know as we saw what was unfolding in China and even in Europe and it in Italy um, it seemed like, you know, it was still too far away and couldn't really affect us as much. Um, and as I mentioned, we've taken all these precautions in New York, um, but, you know, essentially it was already too late. Um, you know, 
these things should have been done, you know, minimum of two weeks prior to when they were done. And, you know, the travel restriction should have been put in place about a month before, you know, we were already behind the ball. And in, uh, you know, when speaking with uh, regards to a pandemic and a novel virus, you know, time is everything, you know, and, um, you know, we sort of already got a little bit of a late start. But my advice would be to the rest of the nation, as I've been saying, and as you can see clearly on the map that I showed you, um, the the speed at which, you know, the virus is, you know, um, being transmitted, um, it, it was really concerning. And, you know, we know scenario if everybody does their part um, and everybody sort of shelters in place and is careful that we have you know an estimate of a hundred thousand deaths you know that's on the best case scenario but you know worst case scenario is over a million you know I mean these numbers are really really alarming um, and I think you know although as I mentioned before that it is really difficult for us to even comprehend and wrap our mind around it especially in areas where you're not seeing much of it and you you think that you know life is still going on and as you mentioned before there is so much disparity between the states and between, you know, the leaders in each um, state, you know, as far as how strict they're being with their recommendations for their communities, I think people need to realize that, you know, as I mentioned before, this virus does not discriminate. Um, it can and it will affect everybody. Um, and it has been. And I can tell you firsthand that I've seen a lot of really sick people. And, you know, and this is something that, you know, has potential to just a completely, you know, uh, spiral even more, even more so than we're already seeing, you know. Um, thankfully, you know, the president put down, uh, extended that shelter in place, um, essentially um, extended uh, for the country. But I think, you know, realistically, um, we are looking at something that's going to go on for uh, a little bit of time still. And as you mentioned before, you know, I'm really fortunate to, you know, be in this wonderful organization called Imana. And, um, and we worked with all these leaders throughout the country to put together Together that statement um, and guidance for religious, you know, organizations. And I think that's something, although it's very difficult, you know, Ramadan is something that is so close to our hearts, um, you know, and this it's something that, you know, takes us, it's the most spiritual time of our lives. We have to figure out how we're going to achieve our spirituality and still sustain and do what we need to um, without it having to cost, you know, people their lives, um, including, you know, it could affect anybody, as I mentioned. So we have to continue with this guidance. We have to, you know, um, still be very careful. And the people who are not being affected so much should really look at these other states as warning signs um, because travel is still happening. Large gatherings are still happening. It's really, really alarming. We know firsthand, we know really well that young people are transmitting, you know, the younger people who uh, are mildly symptomatic or asymptomatic um, or who are not really being affected um, by the virus as much are the ones who are incubating and continuing to transmit. So we really need our, our youth to also, you know, um, cooperate and work with us. The entire nation needs to come together and the entire world needs to come together for this to be a solution before we keep losing more lives. And as I mentioned, you know, there is no cure for it. There is no treatment. And, you know, we have to make sure that what we do in the end is going to be for all of humanity. Dr. Sayed, thank you so much. Uh, this has really been illuminating, very helpful. Um, you've been able to take uh, a ton of information that's coming at a, an increasing velocity to all of us and really simplify and make it clear to us. I want to thank you for your time and your dedication and your effort. Um, I want to also thank everybody in the audience. Uh, this is a recorded session, so it will be available on the imana.org website. Um, I hope you all have a, a wonderful night, and I'm doing prayers and duas that you and your families and loved ones are all safe. Thank you so much for spending your time with us.